This is the first video in my new series, Inside the Standard Library. Today, we'll be looking at the map method on sequences, which transforms elements in a sequence using a function you specify. As this is the first video in a series, I want to take just one minute to explain how these videos work, so please stick with me for a moment. Every video will focus on one commonly used method from the Swift Standard Library, like flat map, compact map, reduce, or more. And each time, we're going to try and recreate that method from scratch in Swift so you can see exactly how it works. My hope is that you'll see these things aren't special or magic and are, in fact, quite understandable once you break them down. Once we've coded our own naive solution to the problem, we're going to look at the equivalent method from the Swift standard library. We'll look at how the Swift team solved the same problem, including what techniques and optimizations they used to make their code better. You'll see many of these techniques in more than one video, so hopefully you'll have lots of chance to learn them thoroughly. So if you're an intermediate Swift developer, I hope you'll get a lot out of the first part where we code methods ourselves. And if you're an advanced developer, I hope you'll get a lot out of the second part where we dig into the standard library code. Now you don't need to watch these videos in order, but chances are it will really help. So I'll reference back to earlier videos as we progress. If you want to follow along with the Swift standard library code, make sure you clone the Swift repository. It's available at github.com slash apple slash Swift. Okay, enough chat, let's get into some code. Like I said, the map method on sequences transforms elements in a sequence using a function we specify. So we could make an array of numbers like this, let numbers equals one, two, three, four, five, and double them using map. Let doubled equals numbers.map dollar zero times two. Or an array of strings like this. Let strings equals apple banana pear and uppercase them like this. Let uppercase equals strings.map dollar zero dot uppercase. This is such a common method in the Swift standard library. I think it's a great place for us to begin. As you've seen, map's able to transform any kind of data into any other kind of data, which means our solution is going to need to use generics. I cover these in detail in my book, Pro Swift. Check it out. But the short version is this. Generics let us use placeholders with data types in methods, so we can call those methods in different ways. Now you can name these placeholders whatever you want, but it's common to see letters T, U, and V. Let's start off simple. Extension sequence, public func map to generic over T, takes a transformation closure which accepts an element from the sequence and returns a T, and the whole thing returns an array of T. Inside there, we'll make a new array of T. We'll do var result equals a new array of T. Then do for item in self, result.append, transform the item. And finally, return result. Now, one of the important things about map is that it works just as well with a throwing function. So we're going to modify ours to handle that by adding throws here. Our transformation function can throw. That means we also need to call it using try, like this. But now we have a problem. Because our transformation function throws, our whole method needs to throw, or we need to handle the error internally. Now, it's definitely not a good idea to handle the error internally, because it's not our problem. Whoever calls our map to function should figure out how to handle errors that are thrown. So we're going to mark our map to method as being throwing. But now we've got a second problem. Every time we call map2, we need to use do, try, and catch, even with functions that don't throw. So the right thing to do here is to mark the function as rethrows rather than throws. This means if the function that gets passed in throws, then map2 throws. But if the function that gets passed in doesn't throw, then map2 doesn't throw either. Okay, that's enough for our solution. Our code works just fine as a replacement for Swift's own map. It's able to work with any kind of sequence and handle errors correctly. Now let's look at how the Swift standard library implements map. All the standard library code is in studlib public core, so I'll change directory into there. The map method we're looking at is stored inside sequence.swift, so I'll open that in Xcode. Now press Command F to search and look for func map. And boom, there's our function. Immediately, you can see they are also using rethrows for this method, so it handles errors correctly. However, it has a few interesting differences from ours. First, it uses Swift's contiguous array type, which is optimized for storing things consecutively in memory. 
This can be used here because it's about to transform every item in the sequence. And at the end of the method, you can see it actually gets converted back into a regular array. We won't be using this thing for a long period of time. Second, it calls reserve capacity on the array, which makes sure the array is able to store approximately enough elements for all transformations. This is the kind of thing you should always call as soon as you create your array, because it has a cost based on the number of items in the array. Third, look at the way it loops over the sequence. Why doesn't Swift just use a for in loop like we did? Well, the answer lies in the use of underestimated count. Some types, such as strings, make it expensive to calculate the actual size of the sequence, because each letter in a string might actually be some complicated Unicode symbol. Underestimated count represents a value that's definitely equal to or lower than the actual size of the array. Everything below that is guaranteed to be in the sequence, and you can see the code actually force unwraps a large chunk of its loop, because it already knows the element definitely exists. Only once it's past the underestimated count does it start being careful, because it might hit the end at any point. So, using underestimated count rather than count is a neat optimization. It will help in some situations where the size of the sequence is known fully, but do nothing in others. And that wraps up our first video. We looked at map, we looked at throws and rethrows, we looked at contiguous arrays, reserving capacity, iterators, and more. We've crammed in a lot. But if you're finding it a little hard to understand fully, don't worry. Many of these techniques are used in the other standard library code we'll look at. So there's lots of opportunity to come back to it. Now it's over to you. What did you learn in this video and how could you apply it to your own code? Leave a comment below with your answer. And if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe to my channel because I publish lots of videos to help you develop your skills as an iOS developer.